What? Yeah. Now I'm... Yeah, I'm behaving myself. I'm, no, I'm not playing in abandoned buildings. What? Again? Now. I suppose you had those people follow me again. Fine. Hey. This is Jimmy Farrow from Monty and the Farrow, and I want to thank all our subscribers. We have now passed 14,000 on our YouTube channel. But I want to ask our subscribers to take the next step for us and become a full-fledged member of Monty and the Pharaoh. Yeah, that's right, folks. There's three different levels to choose from. There's free shirts. There's free autographs. Just check it out and become a member of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh. Later. Welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestler broadcast, Monty Nefaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV, where we just got done hmm. with the great Tommy Rich, and really? it can only get better as we've got icon, Hands of Stone, Ronnie Garvin in the nice. studio. Does but Valentine there's... know that he's here, by the way? No. Oh, that's, just, that's probably a good idea. That's yeah, funny. You always bring up Valentine when we talk. When about I see Ronnie Garvin, Garvin, I think about Greg Valentine, Why? and I think about my frustration as a I kid because he always wound up screwing over Greg Valentine. And I think about Jimmy Garvin. I think about him beating Ric Flair. Okay, right? Yeah, that, that's sure. What I think of course, about. I think about those things. But he was always the bane of my Valentine existence. Oh. Okay. And I still love the man. So you know, it, it is what it is. But Ben, if Valentine knew he was here, he'd probably go. Ugh. Well, we we were speaking, and Ronnie, you could chime in, but we we, you know, we watched mostly WWE, and then when cable came, that's where uh -huh. Georgia Championship Wrestling came oh, about. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't have access to Canada, and then Texas later on. But anyway, the mm -hmm. point is, is that Florida. Um, Bob Backlund, who talk about being of existence when oh. we were growing up, we were just like oh. we rooted for the bad guy. So it was like yeah. we just wanted Backlund to lose. Right. But it's funny right. as you get older. Yes. Backlund has become, like, we've had him in studio, and I mean, he is, what, what did you say the other day? I said that we love Bob Backlund and Ronnie Garvin. Yep. What happened to us? Because when we were kids, we were always rooting for the bad guys, so you guys were driving us well, insane. I, well, when we got to meet you... The respect, which was already developing over the years just because time does that... And then we got to meet you, or Bob, we were like, oh my God, these guys are home runs. So it's amazing how, with age, well, I'm flattered. comes uh, wisdom. So As you grow, though, get older, the lights come on quicker. Oh, sure. More often. Yes. And you say, oh, yes. I used to hate that guy. <laughs> now I like him. Yeah. I did stuff like that. <laughs> there you go. But, but it, was, it was pure wrestling, of course. There. Me and Bob Backlund? Yeah, I, love, I like the guy. He's a, well, I think it also becomes, it's more also the human being that yeah, you the are, right? Yeah, the conduct so, Right, um, right. Again, of we're fans, right? We're not in the biz, and then we have people come on a couch, and we respect everybody that comes in for all that you've done for this sure. industry. And sure. let's, let's be legitimate for the world, right? You've changed the world for the better of what you've done. But there is a difference between some of the people we meet and then a Ronnie Garvin and a Bob Backlund. Yeah. There's certainly um I find it to be rarefied air. Yeah, you know, why why Quite is honestly, that, Ronnie? Out of respect. I don't know. I talk to a lot of fans and you know, they say, Oh, you're a legend and you're this and I don't view myself as a legend. I don't know. I, I wrestling was uh, a work of art to me. You do it right. It's like boxing, it's an art, you know. And uh, first of all, you keep you stay in condition. 
just for your looks. If you go in the ring and you're out of shape, <laughs> people notice it. You, you might not like it, but they notice it. You know, you, their eyes don't lie. You know, and work hard. I always treated the wrestling fans like uh, the best I could. Very polite. They asked for an autograph. I stopped signing autographs. Uh, even some people didn't like me. I, I didn't mind. You buy a ticket, you're, you're allowed to boo, you're allowed to cheer. And uh, where did our income come from? The wrestling fans. People say, oh, well, the promoter pay me. Where did the promoter get the money? From the wrestling fans. And you'd be surprised when you go to these smaller towns in the, in the old days, you know, there was a lot of people. That, they took the, all their kids to the wrestling match, you know. They spend their hard-earned money on entertainment, come to see the wrestling. You know, without wrestling, <laughs> without my, without the fans, there's no wrestling. Mm. Period. You know. So we I, asked Tommy earlier, and it's kind of off script, and now that you're bringing it up, is were you ever requested to maybe make hospital visits for sick oh, children have. and things like that? What was the, how did that feel for you? Terrible. It's heartbreaking. I went to see a kid in the hospital in uh, in Atlanta. They have a children's hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, I was at the TV station, and this lady came in and asked me to go to the hospital to see her kid, and I went, and it was hard to take. I have a hard time talking about it. Mm. He died three, four hours after I left. Mm. Yeah, so after that I was, uh, but I went, you know, I just, because, uh, you know, kids, why do they have cancer? Why do they, and he tried, he was shaking my hand and he was just, had a hard time breathing, you know, his little hand. And uh, at the time I didn't think he was going to die that day, you know, but he died after that. Mm. What's your, what's his your mom sent me a card, and wrote me a letter. Mm. What's your take on uh, famous athletes or slash celebrities who resist the idea that they're a role model and that they don't have to bear any responsibility being in the public eye? How do you feel about uh, that sort of attitude coming from Well, they're full of themselves. Hmm. You know, they don't care about anybody. You know, they, they think because they're in the limelight, they're stars or whatever they want to call themselves. You know, no, you're just like the rest of us. We, we, politicians do that too. They think we're better than us. Uh, a lot of entertainers, people that are making today millions and millions of dollars, they big contract 20 million, 50 million, you know, where do they think the money come from? You know, if nobody watched them, nobody, everybody tuned them out, what would they be? Hmm. You know, they put their legs from pants one leg at a time, you know, <laughs> they know better than we are. People like that, I, I don't understand. I don't do it. I, I couldn't never do that, and never forget where you come from. You know that's 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 another. You know I I was born, and raised very poor, and I got very lucky in life. First of all, when you're healthy, you thank the good Lord every day for it. You know you you can be healthy as heck in in, in one moment, and your career is gone because you're sick. You come down with a disease. You know, there's a lot of people who don't appreciate life. They don't appreciate every single day you wake up. I say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I, hmm. Well said. And treat your treat your friends right, and stay hang around with people that are like you. Same kind of way of thinking about life. You know, people that are don't hang around with people that are no good. You know, and I'll tell you what, I'm, I don't want to brag, but that's one thing I think I'm pretty good about is I can read people, <laughs> believe me, because my, my wife was impressed a few times. I said, that person is no good. So what's, what's your read on my partner here? <laughs> He's nutty, <laughs> but funny. Funny and nutty. <laughs> no, no. Is he a good guy? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, All right. yeah, he's got a good heart. See, you were, you you were probably rooting for him to throw yeah. me under the bus he's, because you I, love controversy. Let me, let me tell you hey, something. what do you think of my buddy next to me? <laughs> what do you think? Good people. He, that, he thank you. Well, he is. He's good fantastic. People. I'll tell you, people that are funny are having a good time in life. There you go. There so you go. You, that's what you try. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Ronnie, we're going we're gonna to hit some news items. Weigh in if you'd like. Oh, no. And then we'll go to commercial break, and then it's news items. Ronnie Garvin. Um, okay. Pat Benatar cuts Hit Me With Her Best bit with your best shot Hit me from with her your set best list okay. due to all the mass shootings. This uh, Rock and Roll oh, Hall of Fame has decided to take stop. Hit Me With Your Best Shot off her stop. concert series. Stop, stop, stop. Why? Why? Because in the title there's the word shot. Everybody knows that this song is about a chick who's saying to a guy, hey, you're hot. Hit me with your best shot. Is that what that's about? Of course it is. You're a real tough cookie with a long history of breaking <laughs> little hearts like the one in me. Hit me with your best shot. Not whip out a gun and blow away a million people. What is this? This is too sensitive. Stop it, Pat. Ronnie? <laughs> it's too sensitive. I'm laughing so hard here. <laughs> 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 How's he going to follow that up, Ronnie? What do you think? All right, okay. I, we'll, go to, we'll go to something else, maybe something more my speed. It's too extreme, changing the... the Person the, reports the, in the post today. What? I saw feet in the toilet and realized I just gave birth <laughs> to a baby. This woman took I, the term special delivery to new limits. <laughs> Lucy Jones of Bristol, English, England, got a big surprise last month when she gave birth to a daughter, Ruby, in the bathroom. <laughs> The new mom, <sighs> new mom claims she never knew she was pregnant. Uh, of course the not. The 22-year-old who believed it was a she burrito. recently got in her period said uh, that she just hit what? the toilet The plans on pushing out poo. <laughs> when, she, when she heard a crash and looked down and there were two feet sticking out of the toilet. Pharaoh... <laughs> How do you not know you're pregnant? Nine months went by. What'd you think you had a tummy ache for fucking six of the nine? You, what'd you thought you gave birth to a burrito in that bowl? This is ridiculous. What is wrong with this? Did they take the baby away? No. They're gonna let him let it, the baby stay with someone who didn't even know they were pregnant. This baby is screwed. Hey, I think that happens more <laughs> often than you think. Really? Yeah. Oh, look what I found in the toilet. It's got feet. And crying? This is normal? Wow. It happens. Oh, this is Hey, Ronnie, ridiculous. if you didn't know, this is the star of the show, Mr. Jimmy where, Farrow. Where? Jimmy Farrow, along with his partner, Bart Griggs, make up the <clears> band <throat> Wisteria Hall. Wisteria Hall sings such great songs as In My Dreams, This Life, Not Far Behind, and Here Comes the Rain. You can find their music. Ronnie, if you're interested in Wisteria Hall, you could go to their YouTube page. You could hit like and subscribe. He could. Uh -huh. You could, could go to Spotify, you could download their music. He could. You could go to Apple Music and download it. You could try and if that. If that one. wasn't good enough, if you what? just didn't have enough, go to Reverb Nation. Right. We're all over the and place. And if anyone didn't know. You spread like mayo. And if you didn't know, this is Long Island's number one pro wrestler broadcast, Monty DeFaro. Catch us, catch us on the Monty DeFaro YouTube page, the Monty DeFaro Facebook Live page. Hear us on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Anchor. Yeah. Also, catch us on the Monty DeFaro Twitch TV page. And if you're lucky enough to live in New York, catch lucky. us on Channel 115 every Tuesday at 9.30 and Saturday at 11.30 where we go back to back with Saturday Night Live where you'll get to see this icon, Mr. Ronnie Garvin, in studio. And also catch us on Channel 20 Tuesdays at 1 a.m. where we combine viewership of over 120,000. Not bad. And very Not interesting bad. enough. Not bad. Ronnie, our contract is up August 2nd, Stop. and I'm in Stop. deep negotiations right now. And the reason I keep mentioning it, because I just want Cable to understand that this is not going to be a pretty discussion. No. No. Anyway, I'm excited for this. This guy is one of my heroes. Yeah. I can't wait until after this commercial is over where we're bringing in Hands of Stone. Hands. Mr. Ronnie Garvin. See you in a sec. Elm Logistics. For all your logistic needs, call 631-299-3595. That's 631-299-3595. Elm Global Logistics. Pride, performance, and partnerships. Tired of that same old, same old breakfast, lunch, and dinner, same old tasting scrambled eggs, burger, that dinner steak, ribs, or pork chops. Why not add a little bit of spice or just a touch of heat? 
to make the difference. Change that scrambled egg with a little bit of Johnny Fabulous's John Cena Sr.'s Million Dollar Jalapeno Hot Sauce. Great on burgers, steaks, chops, and those barbecued ribs. All right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty Nefaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV. Again, very excited to have the great Ronnie Garvin in studio, um, clearly becoming one of my most favorite pro wrestlers. Yeah, he leapfrogged everybody pretty much in my mind. He has. He has. Him and Backlund, that back to back. It, it blows my mind, too. It really does. All right, Ronnie, let's go for uh, a very hot topic right now. We got Ric Flair deciding at the age of 73 that he's going to get back in the ring. Uh, he's even confirmed recently that he's got an injury from his training, and he's sore as shit. That's his words. What do you think about Ric Flair giving this a shot at 73? Well, I wouldn't do it if it was me because uh, I want to leave the impression in what I quit. That's what's in your mind. That's because if you step in the ring in the seventies, your body doesn't look very well, very good. I don't care who you are. <laughs> you know, I hate to say that, but if you're not embarrassed, you know it's a choice. You know, I wouldn't do it personally. You know, and plus you can get hurt. I mean, you know, you get a certain age. I'm seventy-seven years old. Uh, I don't want to break a leg. I don't want to break an ankle. Uh, I've seen it happen when Lutez went over to Japan and he was just doing a demonstration of holes with Inoki and his hip popped out, mm. you know. Because your bones are a whole lot more fragile at 70 some years old and uh, it's easy to get hurt. You know? Let me ask you, that's a really good that you're bringing that up. You're a young guy back then when these older guys wouldn't hang it up. What, were, what, were, what was going through Ronnie Garvin's head? Well, either they, they need the money, maybe, or they need the attention. Uh, I don't really know. I, don't, I have no reason to want to do that. Did you ever get put in a predicament where you had a wrestler, older guy, and have to carry the match? And how was that if that did happen? No, I never did. I can say for that, I never. Uh, the oldest guy I wrestled might have been Ox Baker. Ox Baker? Yeah. But he was still. You know, maybe not in the greatest shape, but he, he was no push around, you know. And I remember I broke all his teeth, his false teeth. Oh. Mm. I dropped a knee drop on his throat and his false teeth popped out of his mouth <laughs> and I stomped him in the ring and I took all the teeth and I... And Did he the, get pissed off? He, oh. <laughs> no, he I had gum eat, afterwards. I he just stink, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I saw him before he died about a month or two at some uh, signing that I was. I can't remember where it was exactly. And he, I liked the guy. He was a character. Yeah. He saw me from across the room, and I heard him like he was three feet in front of me. Hmm. You know, and he called me the buzzsaw. He, he, he would holler. He called me a buzzsaw because I used to like to stomp his toes. <laughs> Ronnie, I had a friend, or we had a friend who passed away at a very young age. He was a huge NWA guy, um, and you were one of his all-time favorites. And the question I have for you is, you get the title from Flair, yeah. and your push get up to that point was huge. The fans were behind you, everything else. Why do you think it didn't work out to the expectations that we all thought it was going to be? Well, that was by design. You know, uh, a booker has a lot to do. Of course. You know, and there was uh, some envious people. You know, I've seen it many times with other guys. You know, uh, you get over too big, you're a threat. You know, it doesn't become any more with the how much money you're drawing is. You know, and the booker, you know, did his best to. I never got booked. I never had a title match after I won the title till I wrestled Ric Flair on the second time. You know, why? You know, I didn't really care at that point, you know, in my career because I was ready to retire anyway. You know, I was 45 years old. You know, I was in good shape. I wasn't retiring because I, was, I had any problem. I was very healthy. 
but it comes a time you got to call it, you know. And when that happened, I even pushed it faster because I quit after that. I quit the promotion, you know. And, and the booker, well, you all know who the booker was, you know. He was hired by Crockett, and he uh, he didn't like the idea of somebody being more over than he was. See, I always was against a wrestler being a booker. Because they push their own self. So, you you draw on money, and but it didn't matter. They just wanted. Well, it didn't. It didn't matter to him, hmm. to his boss maybe, but his boss was mesmerized with him. You know. Was really he bought him a brand new Mercedes? What's that's his, his business? I'm not. But I'm saying, you know, he was controlling a lot of things. And that same guy, the, the Booker. The Rock and Roll Express were so over, they were like rock stars. Well, he couldn't handle it either. He would book them in some small towns, you know, and those guys would sell out. The little town had never had a crowd like that at wrestling matches because they were over like rock stars. And then what he did is he booked himself in six-man tag teams so they could rub off on him. So he was in a six-man tag with him, <laughs> you know. I'm not stupid. I've been around a long time, you know, and I could see all of that. You know. But you don't seem a guy. You don't seem like a guy that would stand for that. Did you approach him at any point and be like, "What's your no, deal, dude?" I, I, I never wanted to let him know. I know I didn't need the promotion. I didn't need them. I could quit working a little, probably five years before. You know, I didn't care. I, I I'm not going to play that game. You know, I'm not going to play that game. Then why do you put the title on you? Uh, because. I think it was the owner, you know, they wanted it, you know. But in a way, he didn't control much of anything, you know, because I don't know. I don't know. I didn't really care. And uh, I enjoyed the ride. It was short. But Did you ever, I, discuss, ever discuss things with Flair when this was all happening? Yeah, Flair. Flair was okay with it. <laughs> but uh, the thing was, <laughs> I never, seeing the standard in the business was, when you lose the title, it's automatically a return. Right. Automatically. Yeah. It was since yeah. the day I got into wrestling. Never had one. Never defended the title. Never had, you know. So, you know, it's bad business. You know, that's why I said a wrestler should, that's involved in, in the wrestling, if he's active, he should not be in the booking uh, because, you know, you're going to eat. a booker's going to take of himself. It's natural. Maybe not all of them, you know. They usually have a, in the old days, we had bookers that were ref, uh, wrestlers that were retired. They weren't wrestling anymore. But that's okay, you know. They don't have much to gain by that. Their career is over, so now they, they're doing the booking to draw money for the company, you know, and... But, uh, yeah, that's what it was, you know. They tried to blame it on uh, maybe, I, I read some articles about uh, McMahon taking over, you know, stopped uh, the pay-per-view, you know. We, didn't, we lost the pay-per-view on that one, you know. But, it, you know, all I can tell you is Joe Louis Arena was packed. Mm. It was sold out, you know. Hey, you can't do any more than that. We didn't get the pay-per-view, so we lost a lot of revenue. Because there was a fight internal there with, you know, the promotions. Yeah, McMahon pulled the strings to stop yeah. you guys, and yeah. that's that's what yeah. happened, right? Yeah. That makes sense. So I wasn't to blame. We sold out the place. Mm -hmm. And another mistake they made is uh, they took the live event out of the Carolinas. That's their base. That's their base. They insulted the people. Sure. You know, they did. Greensboro had never been the same. Any satisfaction of seeing uh, that certain uh, Booker in polka dots years later? Oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he, I watched him. I, I liked him. I, when he started in the business, I used to ride in a car. He rode with me in a car. Uh, Murdoch and all that back in the 60s. But mm -hmm. they weren't Booker. He was not a Booker. He right. was not involved. He was just like one of the boys. So something changed uh, yeah. over the years. Yeah, something. And I loved it. Because I watched him insult 
Vince quite a few times. I mean, insult, knock him on TV, you know. Mm -hmm. And when he went over there, he wound up with polka dots. Mm. And I said, Vince is a genius. You know, he hired, he keeps the guy. He hired the guy. A lot of promoters would have said, "Go screw yourself," you know, "Go somewhere else." No, come on in. Vince took him in because he made money with him with right. polka dots on him. But he got his little revenge, you know, because. You know, there's the American dream turned into a polka dot boy, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't help it but laugh. Yep. So, Ronnie, yep. Let, let me ask you this. Since you brought up Vince, you, you, you kind of got a lot of different questions. Uh, just about an hour and a half ago, Vince McMahon has retired from the WWE. Oh, is he? Um, I, uh, I don't know if you're aware, if you are, the allegations of the things that uh, supposedly he had done. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he has decided to leave professional wrestling and retire. Uh, do you want to like share your thoughts on the alleged things that Vince was claimed on, and and maybe what your thoughts are of, as Vince McMahon as a person, and probably in the end, just for me personally, Vince McMahon, and I don't I'm not trying to guide you any which way. He to me was a idol of mine, both in the business world and as a human being, and I understand things happen. I guess my point to you is, uh, like, t to me, this is a sad day. I, I feel like pro wrestling is dying today. Mm. So I guess the question is, Vince McMahon, the allegations, and your thoughts on the person, well, Vince McMahon. I'd have to wait. Uh, I personally find it very hard to believe. But today there's so many people accusing people, you know, of all kinds of horrible stuff that never happened. And I'll tell you, ever since that... Uh, Politics with Russia that never existed what they were saying. You know, the, the, the conspiracy, you know, conspiracy and all that and uh, never, never happened. You know, and I turn the computer on sometimes and there's stories that, you know, they're lying. There's so much, too much lying. You know, and right now, where's the proof? Somebody accused, you know, you got to wait till they can prove it. You know, well, they do and, have facts, uh, and again, I'm pro Vince McMahon, but they do have facts that Vince has paid people off to keep quiet. I'm not saying he did anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there's there's a background there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure someone at his level that must happen quite often, and I'm not saying that he didn't have affair with affairs with these women. It could have happened. So yeah. what, in my opinion? But um, I, how do you feel this affects the world? I mean, is wrestling dying today? Is this the last day of wrestling? Well, he, he runs, he's, he's got the biggest business in the wrestling business. He's got, that's the biggest. Where do you go from there? I don't know. I don't know if it's dying. I, I think without Vance, wrestling is going to be hurt. Agreed. I think. Agreed. You know, I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I say, I, it's hard for me to believe because, you know, <laughs> but, you know, I want to wait and see before I make any comments that, you know, uh, if he'd done that, uh, I'm so sorry that, you know, he's not the person that I thought he was, mm. you know. That's a great take, Ronnie. That is a great take. You know, and if he did, well, you'll have to deal with it and, and, and pay the price of the consequences, of, you know. Because you know I've always thought that they were a very classy family. Yes. You know, his wife and daughter and son, you know, they were classy people. Do you feel that the company's in good hands considering that it should logically go to Stephanie and Triple H to uh, continue running things? Do you feel like Vince has set up, you know, through his family, you know, a future for the company? I, I think so. He's a very, very smart guy. You know, very smart guy because they, they said he was going to fail. There was, there was so many people against him, you know, when... He, when he, he he took over the whole wrestling actually, and and he took it over because it was there to be taken, you know. He had offered a lot of promoters money. They told him to go screw himself, you know. And uh, I was around the guy. Ah, he's gonna fail. He'll never succeed. They, that, and he succeeded. He had a vision, I guess, you know, entertainment. Uh, yeah, I don't like the way wrestling is today, uh, but financially, I guess it's very rewarding, you know. Who would have thought that they would be on the stock market? It would be a list, you know, especially back way back in, uh, say, the 80s. You know, oh, wrestling one day will be on 
New York Stock Exchange, you know. It's been very successful, a lot of money made. Of course, the technology helped. It's all over the world, all over the world. You can be in China, you can be anywhere on the planet, you know. And it's good for, for, the, for the wrestlers because you make a whole lot more money. See, we, we got to think, I tell the fans, I said, you know, especially the first 10, 15, 20 years when I wrestled, I got paid on the house. What the, what, what, how many people was in the building and, and how much money was there? You know, we didn't have uh, pay-per-views, you know, now that pays millions of dollars automatically, but you got millions of people watching, you know. It's so different than when I was. I got to experience some of it when I went, went to wrestle at WWE 1988 till 90 for two years, you know. That's totally different. When, when you when you joined the WWE, um, I've I've heard some wrestlers. One, for example, Bad News Brown. For example, I don't know if you remember Bad News Allen yeah. at all. He claims that Vince was like, "Come to this, you're going to be a millionaire, you're going to retire." Did Vince offer give you those type of promises, or what was that when he first approaches you to come join the team? How's that conversation no, go? They, when I was there, there was no contract. Period, and he said, "I'll take care of you the best I can." You know. And that's not him, actually, that said it. It was Pat Patterson. Okay. Because I, uh, I had quit, you know, Crockett. And Pat's the one that called me. And he said, we'd like to have you, you know, if you want to come. You know. And I told Pat, I said, yeah, I said, I'd probably like to. I'd never been to the WWE before. My whole career, I stayed in the South. And, uh, and I went. And when I got there, I thought, well, I think I made a mistake. I didn't fit in in there, you know. The way I wrestled, what I did, you know, it's 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 not what they wanted. I don't think, you know. But uh, I looked around and I saw Greg Valentine, and I said, "That's the guy." Yeah. That was about the only guy. Him and 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 before that, I did the same thing when uh, Jake the Snake, you know. Uh, I did real well with Jake the Snake. And I said, "With Greg, I know we can do something." Because I realize that if you're not on a pay-per-view, you're not going to make a whole lot of money. The pay-per-view is where the money is. And uh, so I said, I got to come up with it. So I, I approached Greg, you know, and I said, I got an idea. And it was my idea, the whole thing. Vance changed a couple of little things because he always got to put, put his its touch, which I understand he owns a company. Mm -hmm. Like he called me Rugged Ronnie. Well, he said, you look rugged. <laughs> You know, he wanted to, he's got to put his, you know, input into it. Not for nothing, that's stuck. Yeah. I always think yeah. about you as Rugged Ronnie. Yeah. So that yeah. Vince knew what yeah. he was doing well, there. It kind of rolls off the tongue, right? It does. As they roll. It yeah. completely so, does. So let me ask you this. How does a person like Bad News Brown have, say, that he had a conversation with Vince who says, you're going to make millions, but you're telling me that they offered, like, they're giving you an opportunity, which you hear a lot of people say. Yeah. Why is there such confusion between wrestlers, or is it just that people... Hear what well, they you think. got a lot of people that expect. Maybe he thought Ben said it, but I, I don't believe it. Yeah. yeah, he never said anything like that to me. Right, that's not he consistent. He said we're going to take you know. care of you the best we can. In many old days, when they didn't have contracts, you know, and uh, you had the power if you start drawing, you know, to say, hey, I'm going to leave. You know, I want more money, and usually they come up with more money. You know, that was your only way. If you didn't get over. You didn't have much of an argument about getting mm. more money. Yeah. You know, you don't put any people in the house. You're not over, you know. And it's not all the wrestlers are going to, you know. Plus, you got to have the right guy, the right person to wrestle, and you got to be in the right place. And that's what I saw with Greg, and I was right. You know, it worked. Speaking of uh, drawing power, you did work with Jake the Snake Roberts. Oh yeah. Any, any memories? Yeah, we of went all over uh, uh, Baltimore and uh, and Philadelphia and. Cleveland and back in the 80s, early 80s, and oh man, we went around and yeah. We you did shake real your well. head when you hear stories about him today with some of the things that he's gone through with his life, his antics, and, and you know, all of his battles. And you know, if I could he's just add to that, so you're this really, you're really a respectful, got your shit together guy. Yeah. How hard is it to work with people that just, and again, we're all human, right? We yeah. just talked yeah. about that. Working with people that just can't get their shit together. Well, you just said it. We're human. <laughs> We're all different. 
you know, there's people that don't understand how life works, you know, uh, like you're doing drugs and, and you're not showing up on time and there's always a screw up. They, and, and they're talented usually, people that do that. Is Jake reliable when he worked your programs with you? I mean, he yeah. showed up and everything. This yeah. was a different Jake Roberts than yeah. the one he's become yeah. or yeah. or became? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we had some, I really enjoyed it, you know. I mean, we beat the shit out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. We beat the oh, shit you know, out of each other. You know other. what he says? He goes around, and I saw a video of him. He goes around and tells people, I, the, the harder you hit me, I had goosebumps. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that seems, says. That, that seems to be everybody's point. When they wrestled you, it yeah. was a fight. Like, you, oh, right. you beat the, yeah. the holy hell out of them. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, the guys I made money with never complained. I didn't complain. I'd never give anybody what I wouldn't take. You know, that's, that's fair enough. You know. How about the guys that said, hey, Ronnie, you're not chopping me tonight? I chopped them anyway. You said, I'm chopping you. I don't give. You I can don't leave. Give. You know, yeah. after the third one, if you don't like it, hit the dressing room. <laughs> it is the dressing get, room. Hit the shower, man. There you go. <laughs> I don't want you to know. make this a dusty bashing thing, okay? No, no, but no you, I'm not. No, but yeah, you yeah. mentioned you were riding with Murdoch, who we've had Atlas in. and Well, he Atlas, was one of the boys. He was a good. But he, Matt Atlas claims, or Tony says, that he was a KKK member, and, you know. Murdoch? Eh, after the, I don't know. I, I, you never saw it. I never saw it. Okay. Okay. You know, he was rough around the edges on a lot of stuff. Right. You know, and, uh, but, no, I never. Well, let, let me ask you this. Going back to Bad News, Brian, I keep sticking on this because I just yeah. happened to see this interview. Bad News said that, that Dusty was extremely racist. Did you see that? No, not really. You know, but, I mean, he might have been perceived as that, but I, I didn't see it, you know. Dusty was a good guy. I, I liked him when, when he was one of the boys. We rode together. We had a lot of laughs. We drank beer, you know, went to the bar. I remember we'd race to, we'd wrestle in Jacksonville, and we'd race to Tampa to get back, get the bar, you know, with clothes at one. So sometimes we'd get in just in time to get a couple of beers. <laughs> what caused him to do what he did to you, though, with the booking? Was there like yeah, a, a money, turn money. where Dusty just changed? Or was there an event? Yeah, he changed over to time. Did you try calling him out for his change when it was happening, when he was starting to change? Because, like you said, he was one of the boys with you. Yeah. What happened? Money, greed, mm. money, power, mm. glory, whatever it is. You right. Know. Why do you nah. think Dusty gets a free pass and Hogan gets killed for that sort of protecting your own deal? I don't know. Uh, the business was it was interesting. We had so many characters, you know, and so many personalities, you know. There was some guys that didn't talk very much, you know. There was guys that was out of shape completely. There was guys that was bitching all the time, you know, about this, about that, about everything. Uh, I ignore people like that. You know, you're not going to ruin my day, you know. Uh, people are always bitching and complaining. Well, leave. Yeah. And when it happened to me, I left. I never stayed a place that I, I said, I'm done. And the first thing I did when I, I had a couple of old-timers, Art Nelson, you ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. Art Nelson. And uh, 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 what's his name? He's a Mexican, uh, uh, Pancho Villa. They were like my dad, you know. He was an older guy, ex-boxer, you know, and he was a good wrestler, good worker, you know. And never made big money. I don't know why he should have. But they told me stuff that I never forgot, you know. You know, because Pancho told me, he says, I never done it, and he says, I regret it. He says, first thing we should do when we get in, in, in wrestling back in those days is save enough money that you can live a couple, two, three months without, you know, in case you get hurt, you know, because there was a lot of guys that lived on day, day to day, you know, they didn't make big money, they made enough money to live. I never had a problem with that. And I did that. And when I reached a point that I had six months to a year, I, I didn't care. I was ready to go if, if it didn't work out because if they knew you were broke, they took advantage of you. Mm -hmm. Guys would move their whole family. Mm. Say from Florida to Texas, or Florida to Oklahoma, or Florida to where, 
you know, they got kids, they got to enroll in school, they got to rent a house or apartment. You know, there's a lot of uh, deposits for electric, deposit for this. That's a lot of expense to move a family. And the promoters, when they find out you're broke, man, they treated them like dirt. They eat lunch. You and know, they, they give were, Vince McMahon a hard time. And they were stuck. Yeah. You know, not who, all promoters did who, that. who was, in your illustrious career, was the most evilest of promoters? I think Nick Goulas. Really? Nick Why? Goulas and Tony Santos. Why? Nick Goulas probably more than that. Why? The guy was just, uh, he was just a bad person. He was, you know, I worked for him, and he never talked to me. I got called, I wrestled for, for, for his promotion in 1972, I think. It was, uh, what's his name, the wrestler that was a booker there. Uh, they wanted me to come to Memphis. I'll think of his name in a minute. Well, well I think of Memphis, I think of Lawler. Not Lawler, the other. It, it's another Jerry thing. Jarrett? Jerry Jarrett. There we go. Jerry Jarrett called me. Terry was at Jimmy as a manager, and they had another, he had a partner. And he wanted me to take the, the partner's place. He wanted two two brother image thing, you know, and because I was leaving Charlotte, and I said, I don't want to go because I, I don't want to deal with Nick Goulas. I swear to God, I would never go there, you know, because I had heard so many stories. After you hear 30, 40, 50 stories yeah. about the guy, and none of it is good. <laughs> Why would you want to go? It there? might be a pattern. You right. know, yeah, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. So, oh no, no, no! He says, "You'll deal with me." I said, "Okay," but you gotta make sure I don't want to deal with Nick Gillis. Well, I went, and the first day I went to the office, the first day—that's how cartoon that territory was. I walked in on a Monday to get my bookings. And they said, uh, "We can get you a ride." I said, "No, ma'am." It was Christine Jarrett, the mother. She was running the office for Nick. I said, no, ma'am. I said, I'll drive by myself. She said, well, I got a bag for you. She had a bag. It was an outfit of a, of a, uh, uh, like a doctor, what do you call it? A medic mm -hmm. with a mask and everything. Oh, want boy. me to wear that. I said, ma'am, you can tell Nick Goulas he can wear it. I'm not a cartoon. I came here to do business. And I says, I'm heading out of here. Goodbye. I turned around and walked out. Wow. And uh, they had the stooge there, the, uh, one of the, every office has a stooge. I okay. can't remember his name. Okay. He, f he followed me all the way to my car. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie, no, no, uh, Gula, uh, not, uh, Dusek, Dusek. He ch oh, no, he says, Christine said to come back. Christine said, I, I said, no, I'm out of here. Well, I'm halfway into the car, and he's hanging on to me. No, please, he <laughs> says. <laughs> I said, well, I'll tell you what. I don't want to be, be a mess guy. I said, I'll walk back in there and see, you know, what I can do. I walked back in there and I said, ma'am, if I hear any more about this cartoon stuff, I wrestled. My name's Ronnie Garvin, by the way. I'm not a medic. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not anything like that. I'm Ronnie Garvin. If you can't accept it, just let me know. Oh, we apologize. She apologized, apologized over and over. <laughs> I said, I'll go. I was booked in Birmingham on a Monday. Memphis was on a Monday. There was two towns every night. So they didn't want to put me in Memphis right away with, with Terry. They were going to ease out his partner, and I was going to come in. Oh, we did good business when that happened. Oh, man, Memphis sold out every week. Every week. I've never seen a town like that. Wow. <laughs> Sell out. No matter. I, it was just, I, what a... It was the best town I've ever seen for wrestling. I yeah, mean, it, it, Memphis, from what you hear, was crazy back oh, then. So oh, let good. me ask you about wrestlers. You talked, about, again, not bashing Dusty Rose. People take, take take themselves too seriously. You've wrestled so many people. You're, you're a legend who has wrestled legends. Um, did you ever have the opportunity to wrestle a Mil Mascaris? No. Who, what wrestler took their gimmick so seriously they were too difficult to work with? Uh, I never had really a hard time with anybody. To tell you the truth, I never, I never run into a, anybody. I never, I never had a problem. I only had one problem. Well, it was a problem not with me, with Randy Savage. You know, we, we, 
I didn't know the guy. He just came in. And uh, Tiger Conway and myself were against the, the Poffles, Randy Savage and him. And uh, I don't know if I ever told that story before. Yeah, I think you guys. clobbered him with an implement of destruction. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that was the only problem. <laughs> That's what I remember. Uh, yeah, it didn't wow. last long. Well, they were going to team up on him and, and beat right. him up. Right. And uh, it was a lousy match, you know, because I don't know what was going on. Mm. And then I was his partner, and I said, well, you ain't going you, you to <laughs> double a <laughs> on my partner without me being involved. And when we left the ring, the match was over. They jumped him. And I handed it real quick. <laughs> was, was the Poffo family an odd type of family? Uh, I mean, was Angelo... Oh. The miser that you want to hear the best one every single day. I was in the office, I had 20% of that territory, you know, I had bought, and uh, I didn't know him very well. They came to me, and Bob Rube and Bob Orton, they wanted her, so that's how I got involved. And uh, every single day, we were in the office, Rube and Orton, we'd look at each other. Angelo would say, Better dead than poor and alive. And I'm going, huh, better dead. Uh, no, no, better, <laughs> I got it wrong. Better rich and dead than poor and alive. W he had something about money. He was the miser. He was a real miser. There was no work there. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was a miser. I mean, better rich and dead than poor and alive. That was the line that we heard almost every day like a prayer. <laughs> And he brought in a couple of friends. Uh, one guy, he was a, from Hawaii. I can't remember his name now. Oh, he's, he can cook so good. We've known him for 20-some years. With, and then when he got there, they treated him like dirt. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we mm. looked at each other. And it, was, it was a weird family. Was Randy more like Angelo and Lanny was kind of the oddball? Lanny was a happy-go-lucky guy. You know, really, he was... I like Lanny. He, he he didn't care about much, you know. He just liked to have a good life. And, What'd you and think of the name Lanny, though? Lanny? Like I always thought, like why'd you name this guy Lanny? Leaping Lanny. Forget Leaping, Leaping Lanny. I Leaping just, like, just makes it. I mean, is that his real know. name, Lanny? It's his real name, yeah. right? Yeah. That's yeah. an odd name, yeah. is not? Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, here's my son Randy, <laughs> and here's this kid I really don't like that much. Here, <laughs> <Yes>. Lanny. <laughs> That's we'll awful. name him Lanny. Uh, <laughs> born to be the genius, obviously. Oh, it was weird. Uh, the, the whole family, I think Lanny was the... He's the cool one. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah, he liked to laugh. And there you just, go. He didn't care. He, he balanced get, that name. So you, you're, you're around I all, like these, Lanny you're around all these, <laughs> these bookers, right? Yeah. And now we see that their sons have turned into these mm -hmm. wrestlers. Mm -hmm. Did you feel a necessity like the kiss the son's asses like at some point like be I nice never, to him even though you didn't like them that's one of. thing i never did i can't see him doing I, it yeah you're gonna <laughs> no. nope. like was cody rose just like a little punk like yeah hey, my dad is the booker and like poking <laughs> you or something <laughs> like that i never i never met the kids no never huh there never you go. met the kids i didn't even know he had two sons there you go i didn't know yeah i knew he had one it was the other one there. dustin uh dustin yeah I right knew that. but right. i didn't know he had another one right yeah. I never got a real personal with him, you know, about his life and all that. You know, even at the beginning, we was just kids, you know, get back to the bar. You know, I was mm. in my 20s. And right. they, were, they were in their 20s, you know. We ride the road. I drove like a maniac, <laughs> you know, 100 <laughs> miles an hour to get to the bar. <laughs> there you go. We'd slide in the parking lot in the gravel with the brakes on, and we'd just beat, just got there without a second to lose. <laughs> they were closing, you know. It was like a race. It was funny. Yeah. Previously, when you know, we talked about you know you really being one of the guys that defeated Andre the Giant, which was kind of in a handicap in match. a handicap, which kind of brushed. Right. Yeah. What, was we Andre difficult to work with, or was he? What was Andre like? Andre, if Andre liked you, he give you the moon. And he just happened to like me, and I don't know why. You got I had him. We had him. My wife and I had him over. Maybe because I spoke French, you know. Uh, but from day one, you know, he was he was a gentleman. Did your wife have to cook for Andre when you, know, you had him? He didn't eat very much. He didn't eat any more than I did. He really? What? He drank a lot. Just drank a lot. Just yeah. drank a lot. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, one plate of food is all I. Wow. My wife thought, oh my God, yeah, I'm going to have to. Yeah. Cook two pigs and a, and a whole. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you have them over? <laughs> no, hold on. You have them over the house. Hi, right? <clears throat> hey, honey. I'm bringing Andre the Giant. Yeah. But, uh, hey. Where's he sitting? Uh, we had. We, funny if enough, we had one big chair, uh, rustic. You know, it was heavy, heavy duty chair. Okay. And that's what he sat on. So your wife's like, I got the perfect chair for this guy. Yeah, it was like an antique thing, that, but it was. <laughs> <in the place. laughs> And you're a wood, you're a woodsman type. At least you strike me as that. Did you have a big outhouse in the back for this poor fella? I mean, <laughs> after the one plate of food, I well, you know, it's funny. You I say don't that. know. It's probably I just wondered. Probably you know, why he didn't eat so much, right? That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, Holy he was limit. full of liquid. Oi. <laughs> he drank. He drank a lot. You, know, you mentioned drank. earlier about but guys. he was a he was a good soul, man. I tell you. Yeah, well, you're very fortunate. He just naturally liked you because we've yeah. heard stories of when he doesn't like somebody. That's it's oh, not yeah. a good place yeah. to be. Yeah. Not a good place to be. Well, I was with him one time. With the, I couldn't believe it. I was in New Orleans. And we went on the Bourbon Street. My wife was with us. And we had the guy from Canada, the big, big guy. He was his interpreter. See, when, when I did all that, he hadn't been in the States very long. Mm. His English was not very good. Oh, okay. You know. But he understood. Early. He understood a lot of English. Anyway, we're coming out of Bourbon Street going back to our car. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And there's a couple coming by us. And there's, this guy was about, you know, five foot seven, five foot. He looks at Andre and he says, what a freak. Oh. Call him a freak. Wow, oh, boy. Andre picked him up with the shirt, <sighs> lifted him up, and he went like a slow motion. He would have killed him if he hit him a heart. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His hand was so he heavy just took it, he just, sick, you know. He, I think he knew his, his strength. He know. did. Okay. But he knocked him out. He dropped him on the side. The guy, and the wife is screaming. So he picked him up a second time, and he went another one. <laughs> it was like a slow motion, you know. And you heard the puff, you know. Wow, wow. And he dropped him again. Yeah. And I said, oh, shit, we're going to jail. So I said, let's go. So we started going towards the car. And we turned the corner, and there's our car. And I said, man, we don't, I don't want to hear no sirens or whistles or anything. So we got in the car, and we drove off. Never wow. heard him. Never heard a word wow. about it. That woman yeah. would scream. Speaking of someone who should have probably been <laughs> smacked in the mug a few times, what did you, did you have a relationship with Jim Cornette? Can I ask about Jim Cornette? Jim Cornette? He, he said he was scared to death of me. <laughs> he was scared to death of you. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay. How did we get along with Mr. Tennis Racket? Uh, well, he said I looked like a maniac in the ring. <laughs> That's what I heard him say that on some interview or something. and Because uh, they put him in the ring with me one time. I forgot some kind of gimmick match you know if i beat the guy or something he gets five minutes with me in the yeah ring. yeah something okay like that. i can't remember all the details but the, right he thought he was going to die i guess <laughs> the way he called he says <laughs> he says he looked like a maniac but he was all right he's you know, okay only one time I, were, were you protective over the industry though because you know again you, you oh yeah yeah so it's like here's cornet we talked about it with this tommy earlier I guess, from what I understand, his mother used to pay people to allow him to like get involved in. Way the in the beginning. Way in the beginning. How does someone like a Ronnie Garvin accept this outsider into the industry? Well, I never knew the history. Okay. You know, you know I, I didn't hang around with a lot of guys. You know, you pick your friends. That's who you hang around. I travel with guys I really like. You know, Rock and Roll Express, man. We. We purchased live <laughs> in the plane. You know, I had a plane, and when, when I go north in uh, Ohio and Michigan in the 80s, you know, uh, it was, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I forgot his name. Man. Did the boys always jump on your plane like, hey, Ronnie, can I get a flight with you? Or? Oh, as soon as their bookings come out. Are you in that town? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. If I would have had all 50 seats, they would have filled it up, I guess. <laughs> now, did you charge them to, oh, yeah. to fly yeah. with you? Yeah, they paid. Yeah. Uh, okay, nice. cool. Yeah. They nice. paid. What I did is I, what the cost of my airplane was to operate, you know, and mm -hmm. they split it between them, you know. And uh, so the, basically, I, I never, it paid for itself. 
You ever try to get Dusty on the plane? You got to drop them off over the Atlantic Ocean? I didn't have a plane big enough. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> big. That's great. I should have got a transport plane. <laughs> Farrow hates flying, so oh, can I'm you not tell a fan. Not a fan. The many times you've flown, can you maybe share a story where it got a little dicey and you thought maybe Oh, some of the boys can home? tell you some good ones. Let's hear it. I, some of that I forgot because they always bring it up every time I run into them. You know, the Rock and Roll Express, one time we went through a storm. They, they were holding each other, but their legs in the back, they were like, you know, because we were bouncing and going up oh, and yeah. down. And mm. <laughs> I mean, mm. No. <laughs> they thought they were going to die, I guess. Mm. You know, another time I made a landing because I lost my electrical. Oh. I made a landing and uh, uh, fixed the problem. Oh, my God. You know, then we the took problem. off again. Who was and, in the plane with you? Not uh, me. I forgot. <coughs> uh, well, let me ask you this. Did Rock and Roll Express never fly with you again oh, no, after that experience? They flew with me they right flew back with you the again. the next day. Then they, it couldn't have been that bad. They, they always went back. Oh, they said, man, <laughs> you did a hell of a job. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> Get back in the plane again. My first and only time bouncing down the runway, I jumped out and kissed the ground and never got on one again. <laughs> no flying That's it. for Farrow. No flying well, I flew for DC-3s me. for 13 years. Wow. Yeah, cargo. Yeah. Didn't you ever worry, though? I, I mean, had 13 shutdowns engines in 13 years. I mean, uh, 33. How do you get back into I a plane? I got it in my logbook still. How do you get back into a plane after having, like you said, once or twice a mechanical issue with confidence? I'd be well, scared you train, you train for it. You, you got procedures you go through. Okay. And uh, you hope for the best and don't screw up. Well, it's a like the guy that landed in uh, Hudson. A lot you of know. the planes you fly, right, though, right. pretty yeah. much handle themselves, right? Oh, no, there was all hand. No. Oh, so you were doing a hand. Well, they they were built in thirty nine and forty and forty two. Right. right. So let me ask you this though. So then I hear when you fly, if you become very like discombobulated, it's it's big time problem because you don't know if you're going up or down. Oh, like How, JFK. That's well, somebody disoriented. Yeah, I was I, I'm instrument rating. If you got an instrument rating, you're trained for that. Mm -hmm. You know, well your instrument will tell you what your airplane. If you're right side up, you know, if you're a, a new pilot and and you go fly and you get into a cloud and you don't have instrument rating that's what's dangerous sure because you won't know if you're upside down if you're sideways right you know you go you got a a, a attitude horizon you know and you and that's how you tells you which side the plane is at if you're turning you know yeah i got i i bought my airplane and about Eight months later, I went and got my instrument rating because I was using it at night, coming back, you know. So without instrument rating, you're just flying. You can fly all day long, which is fine. But if you're going to use it for business, you better get instrument rating. Mm -hmm. And then I got my commercial, and I got more, and uh, you know. Mm. Now it's a, it's a, what's his name, uh, Kennedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Junior. He, yeah. That was so stupid, you know. He did it. They didn't have to die. He was dumb, you know. Maybe that's why he went two or three times to get the test on the, being a lawyer. You does, know? His, does his story sound believable to you? Because I still feel that they snubbed him out. <laughs> yeah, it's very believable. Is it? Interesting. Yeah. He, he just was overwhelmed. Mm. The airplane was too much for him. Wow. It's, well, he waste. had the money. He could afford the airplane. It was too, too complicated of an airplane and too fast for him. For him. He should have been in something Damn. a little bit smaller and, you know, not as fast. Because it's yeah. like driving a car. Could we drive around the track at 200 miles an hour? Any of us? No. <laughs> yeah. There you well, go. Well, airplanes, things happen fast. There you go. You know. There and you, go. uh, you got to be ahead of the airplane. In this case, the plane was ahead of him. You know, he lost it, you know. Wow. He didn't have a clue. Killed his wife and the sister-in-law and himself. <laughs> Well, you, you hear, as I say, you hear this all the time. Once they get, they lose what yeah. they're doing. It's 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 over. You get over. disoriented, yeah, because they didn't learn to fly instrument. It's it takes about three months. Mm. Yeah, every bit of three months, well, unless you want to do it every day. It might you might be able to do it in a couple of weeks, but there's a lot to cram in. You know, there's a, there's 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 a test. They take you for a check ride. You know, they block your your windshield. You know, you can only see the instrument. You can't see outside. It put a mask, uh, uh, a hood on you, you know, and you only got the instrument right in front of you to simulate. Because when you're in the fog, it's gray. You don't see nothing. So you don't know if you're flying this yeah. way or this way. 
How come this is not mandatory to take this? Well, it's mandatory if you fly commercial. Okay. No, it's, but, but just in general, and it though. should be. Well, it's mandatory for somebody that's got brain. Yeah. Okay. You, know, you 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 put it. You make it mandatory for you. Right. To save your life. So wh right. what's the bigger rush? Flying your wrestling friends to the next town, or wrestling at WrestleMania? I love flying. That's my love of my life. I miss it till today, this day. I rest, I retired in 03. I haven't flown since 03. Still got my license. Uh, if I pass my physical, I could fly again, but I don't want to do it. Right. You know? But, uh, yeah, flying. WrestleMania was great. It was great. I enjoyed it, you know. But the flying, I, I told the boss, my boss, when I was, I said, you didn't know this, but I would have taken this job without pay. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's great. Mm. You know, it was a, it was an adventure. We flew cargo that was on demand. It was not a routine. You get called, you're going to Seattle. You get called, you're going to Puerto Rico. You get called, you're going to Miami. In the middle of the night, we flew cargo all over the states, and even we went. To, I went to South America one time, one trip. Uh, I went to Puerto Rico two or three times on, on a relief thing. They had a hurricane that went through there, so I was flying. Her. Hurricane relief, you know, the waters and all kinds of stuff, loads of it, our company did, you know. And, uh, you know, it was an adventure. It was not a routine. If you fly for an airline, I didn't want to fly people. If you fly for an airline, you bid on a route every month. Well, they used to be. I don't know if they do that right. still. But it gets boring. You're doing the same route, back and forth, back and forth, back. You know, I this year it was a, man, and you're free. I'm the captain. It's up to me to keep it safe, fly the plane. It's my decision. We didn't have anybody. You know, the company didn't. No decision on them. You know, can you do it? Yes, sir. I never turn a trip down, ever, in 13 years. You can hear that. You could definitely hear the passion that yeah. you have oh. for it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Forgive me for this, but I heard you mention Puerto Rico, and I just want to know what a legend thinks about. Here you are. I don't know if he was. If you were there, but I don't think you were there. But when you hear Brody, Bruiser Brody gets killed in Puerto Rico as a wrestler, what what what's going through your mind? I wasn't surprised. Brody what? was a good guy. He flew with me, and he was a good, but he was pushy. And you got to be careful. Mm. He's a big guy, you know. Uh, people, you, know, you got to be careful what what you say to people and what you, you know, if you perceive a threat, how's the person going to react? You know, and he could have been physical. You know, I've never seen him physical, but you know, and uh, he was impressive. You know, he was a big guy, and it was he was a hell of a heel. And I think personally, he was a good guy. I never had a problem with him. Uh, him and Robley, they'd fly with me when I was in Oklahoma. By the and way, you're not the first person that has said on that couch that Brody might have pushed the limits on this deal and I caused think, this upon Well, himself. first of all. The guy, had, it's not an excuse. I don't use it as an excuse. But first of all, his state of mind, because he lost his girl, his little girl drowned in the pool. In uh, Vader. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. You know. Okay. And Brody was hard to do business with, you know, in the ring. And I don't know any more than that, you know. Uh, there's a reason for a man to wrap a towel around your wrist and having a knife and going into a room and, you know, stabbing him. Mm. But I don't know. I wasn't there. But uh, it shouldn't have happened. But Did you don't know the state of mind of a person sometimes yeah. when they have a tragedy yeah. happen in their life, and it's a kid. You know. Did, did you ever work Puerto Rico? Oh yeah. So I wonder after that. So <laughs> I made some money there because they paid me well. Uh, what's his name? Called me. Uh, Cologne. Cologne. I've knew him for years. Mm. He, he called me, yeah. and he said, "We need you," and they took care of me. And I said, well, you know, I'll go because I, I have no, no problem going over there. I don't have no enemies, you know. This is after Brody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you one of the first ones to go there after a Brody? Of, a lot of the guys boycotted. You know? Right. So you're one of the first to go there after the Brody incident. Uh, I don't remember if I was just the first, but yeah. One I, of the first. Yeah, it was not long after. Right, you know? right. And, uh, <sighs> man, I went. I said, I didn't have anything to do with that. I mean, the guy never went to jail, but, you know. You're in a different country. You're, I mean, you're, mm. you're part of the United States, but, but still, you know. And, and 
what didn't help him it was his gimmick. He was a hell of a heel, you know. And he looked like a vicious guy, you know. You know, in in his gimmick when he wrestled, you know, mm-hmm. he was a violent guy in the ring wrestling, and that, and that, that probably didn't help. Right. You know, people right. look at that, and, they, and the, the the guy, the other guy, was a small guy. He's a small guy. He's not a big guy. All right. Ronnie, I got a fan question uh, out there. He says, thoughts on Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan? What is what now? Your thoughts on Gorilla Monsoon and, and Bobby Heenan, who, by the way, rest in peace to his yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray Reason. Oh, I, I saw him about two, three years before he died. I was at a, at a signing. He saw me across the room, and I could hear, ah, I <laughs> Oh, I felt so bad. Mm. I didn't know he had throat cancer. Right, right. Know? And he gave me his book. You know, I wanted to pay him. And I, he said, no, I don't want no money. You're insulting me if you give me money. He was a funny guy. You know, he make you laugh. I made trips with him. <laughs> Jeez, he, he was always he was always joking. You know, it's like there was no serious moment. You know. How about Gorilla? Gorilla, I didn't know him that well, but I liked him. You know, he was a big guy. And, you know, he treated me good when I was in, in, in New York, you know. Yeah. Vince treats you better than a lot of the NWA territories? Did Vince, your experience with WWF, uh, actually better treatment than most of the NWA territories you went through? WWF, they treated me good. I never had a problem ex- because I didn't go to places that had a bad reputation. Okay. You know, I just bypassed it. Okay. I, I had calls all the time, you know, to go here, go Minnesota. I didn't like Minnesota because I didn't want to be in the cold weather. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the West Coast, I went to California early in my career. I wasn't there but a week. It was crazy then. <laughs> it's still crazy today. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, I went to Oregon. I liked Oregon. But uh, I didn't stay either. I stayed. I, I just passed it through. And uh, I I just like the South, you know, the southeastern corner, you know. And I I liked, uh, I, I lived in uh, Oklahoma. I liked Leroy McGurk. was very nice. You know, a very nice guy. I remember when I went there, and uh, and he said, "Well, I got to let you go. You're pretty green." And he says, uh, "But I can get you booked." Well, I was in Boston. Tony Santos would have never got me booked anywhere. You know, <laughs> so I said, "Sure," and he got me into uh, Houston, and I went to Houston for a couple, two, three months. You know, and I, when you're green, you know, you can't stay long. You know, mm-hmm. they just turn the guys, the young guys under, you know, back then. Right. You know, you did. You stayed three months, and they ship you out somewhere else. Then from there, I think I went to Mobile, Alabama, which is good. That's how you get your experience, you know. Ronnie, I got a few questions before we cut out. Fan asking, what's your thoughts on Bruce Pritchard? Pritchard. He was the he was yeah a booker and probably a writer for the WWE at the time you were there. Yeah, I don't really know him that well, you know. I wasn't around him much. I ran into him. I remember his name, you know. I remember his name. But as far as the, uh, I never traveled with him. I never spent, uh, had conversations with him much. It was high, high, you know, <laughs> small talk. Ronnie, I'm going to throw myself under the bus here. I'm not a very big fan of women's wrestling. I'm just not. Yeah. Uh, obviously, back in your day, they were they they had their spot on the card here and there, but. How do you feel about today, the way the women have become almost, you know, like the main event half the time, it seems? Would, you know, any take on that? No, I don't know. I, does it draw? I don't know, Mike. Does it draw? To me, it draws. Yeah, well, it draws his attention, but well, I'm not so sure it draws mine. Well, you know? I, I'm going to have to look and see if it draws me. Yeah, there you go. All right, <laughs> so he's going to have to look out. into that I'm one. i have to check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's been a very interesting rise. It's, I know it's completely different than the old days. Sure. Ronnie, one more question from a fan. I'm sorry. I got to yeah. want to change my outfit a little bit change Faro, because outfit? the way my uh, eyes are working now. Which one with your computer. outfit? Well, cuz I can't Doesn't really smell see, or anything. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what, Ronnie, don't 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 <laughs> feed into this nonsense. What are you what are you um, talking about? Yeah, put this on. Bra- uh, Bam Bam no says, way. "I know Ronnie Garm is one hell uh, of a tough guy. How would he rate Raymond Rougeau. No. Oh. Raymond is a pretty tough guy himself. I wrestled the, the, the Rougeaus in Montreal, 1985. And uh, 
Well, they come from a family that, you know, very popular in Montreal. His dad was probably one of the toughest guy <laughs> in Montreal, you know. And Johnny, you know, Johnny was like a king of there. He was, he was like Hulk Hogan of Canada. Mm. And uh, when we went there and we we wrestled the Rougeos, you know, and uh, we beat the hell out of them. And the, their dads came in the ring. He was at ringside. He came in the ring, and when he came in the ring, I, I got him and I body slammed him and I climbed the top rope and came out on his neck. Mm. And they carted him to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. Oh, people. And, well, the whole thing started when they came in the ring, Precious pepper sprayed them in the face. You know, she had that uh, spray yeah, stuff, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I beat the hell out of Raymond. And we Pearl Harbored them when they came through the ropes, you know. And uh, I never thought this was going to go anywhere. It was just, to me, it was pretty normal, pretty regular. But since it was the Rougeos, you know, people were pissed. Mm. I mean, God. So I wound up staying four or five months. Everywhere we went, we sold out. Yeah. Everywhere, the whole province, we sold out. And... That was that grudge lasted the whole summer till probably the end of uh, August of, uh, yeah. and uh, I was leaving in, uh, in September. You know, I told him I wasn't up there. As I wanted to wrestle once a week, just deduct all my taxes. You know, one match a week. And uh, first of all, now I'm I'm wrestling almost every night in all the cities all over the Chicoutimi, Quebec, and and uh, and we had the big blowout uh, uh, in 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 uh, August, I think it was at the Montreal Forum. And guess what's on the front page of the newspaper? Record crowd ever in the Forum in Montreal. My mom and dad were so, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't mm. believe it. Yeah, mm. the biggest crowd ever. I mean, we sold out. I couldn't believe my eyes. And, and, and I said, you know, I went up there just to be on vacation, and we wound up breaking a, a record without even really trying. Think, think about what you've done for this industry. So I want to remind everybody that Ronnie is at in Hamburg. Um, yes. He'll be doing yeah. meet and greets. This yeah. is an opportunity to meet this yeah. icon. Uh, Ronnie, we're going to hit you with the Pharaoh's final question, but I want to hit you with one first. And Pharaoh's final question, you're out of here. I want you to get to Pennsylvania safely. Sir, we thank you for everything you've done for the industry, and you're one hell of a human being, and well, you're such a pleasure. Well, Phil out there asks, does Ronnie remember being in the video promo with his feud with Jake the Snake Roberts on the set of the video John Cougars when the walls come crumbling down? Yes, I do. Please. I remember something about that. My memory is not real good, but it rings a bell. Let's say it rings a bell. I don't remember all of I, I had so no idea about this. Well, I got to tell you, I'm going to watch this is when the walls come crumbling down. Now Are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know. Wow. That's real crazy. I, I, it, it rings a bell somehow. But uh, That's unbelievable. <laughs> I, I want to know more. <laughs> All right. Not just you. The <laughs> Pharaoh's, Ron, this is the Pharaoh's <laughs> final question. Now, this is unscripted. What? I have no idea what he's going to ask you. He may ask what type of socks you're wearing right now. <laughs> I don't Why know. would I do but that? You don't feed into this guy, Ronnie. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Pharaoh, you're on. <laughs> okay, fine. Rugged Ronnie Garvin, obviously legendary. Why don't you call him Hands of Stone, Ronnie? Because <laughs> he's. Uh, I'm going to go with Vince for now. But of course he's things. hands of stone. What do you want me to say? Hands of spud? What are you? What are you? What are you talking hands about? Of spud. I don't I just it. You want things to make sense? Find another guy. Okay. All right. Go I ahead. mean, what are we talking here? I'm sorry, rugged, I interrupted. Rugged, right? No, it's, it's okay. Do you have any more comments from the fans? What? No. <laughs> you sure? Rugged Ronnie Garvin, hands of stone. See, there we go. I threw it in there for Beautiful. you, big guy. Okay. Obviously a badass. Obviously. But I ask you, who was, in your opinion? The toughest guy you ever got in the ring with. The toughest guy. Since you are the quintessential tough guy, anybody? Uh, God, that's a, that's a good one. There, there you go. Uh, I think Aku. One more time for me? Aku. 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 Damn, so his reputation is. He's yeah. known as the baddest mofo oh, in the business. He's a bad, but he's a good guy. What makes him so bad? 
What is it, what, what is it about him? What makes him so bad? We've seen bigger. We've seen oh. more. What is it? <laughs> Size don't matter in a fight. Not in that one, huh? Not with this oh. guy. God damn. Oh, he's, he's, he's a very strong guy. I mean, <laughs> he, he's, uh, his, his ability at fighting is, is unreal. Wow. You know, but I like to work with him. You know, I did. I enjoyed it. I didn't work with him, but maybe three or four times, three times maybe. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Damn. And right. he's a good guy. He's age a, age old question then. Andre the Giant of Bruce Lee, who would have won in a fight? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Who's winning? Oh, I think Andre would. Uh, you you know, think Andre would take yeah, Bruce Lee? Yeah. I say the, I say the same thing. Uh, anyway. Mr. Garber, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming I really on our show. It. You're the man. You uh, are a legend. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Again, get this opportunity to meet Ronnie Garvin. Hands of stone. Rugged, Ronnie too. Ronnie Garvin. <laughs> thank you, guys. In Hamburg. <laughs> All right. God bless. We'll God see you guys. Thank you for joining us on Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Be safe out there. You've been watching Monty and the Pharaoh. And until <laughs> what? What? Thursday? Thursday. Is that Thursday? Yeah. yeah. We'll see you Thursday. Later. Thursday. I'm going to